question I had, you said you had audio coming out of the computer. So I, I don't know if there's one of them won't be a problem because one of the videos I'm showing is married. Or rather uh, there's a right now right now you're mic'd. Oh. Right. So one of the videos has subtitles. The other videos it doesn't matter so much that there's sound. There's one video that I can try and have it come out of my speaker here simultaneously transmitting it to there. So I'm actually going to try and get that configured right now. Okay. And that way we won't have any difficulty with the sound. Because it's right, you've got your speaker right by that portable mic for the for the syncing. So that's great. Exactly. So I just have to make sure that I'm translating on both audio sources. Okay. So I won't interrupt you. I'll let you do that. Uh, when I introduce what time do I need to use? Oh, um, I will, I, uh, what happened to the new one uh, I gave you that one. You took it from there, right? Let me just come here. We just had two that were right here. Okay, can you... Um, oh, maybe oh, this I one. See it. Oh, is it? oh, there. Okay, found it. So maybe what you can do when it's time to introduce him is, you, could you escort me from my chair to beside him yeah, how and, and give me the mic? I can, give, I can give you the mic right now, and you can have it. Um, and there's here, right here, is the input. I have a solution. You have a solution? Yes. I'm going to mute my the video that needs audio. I'm going to mute the video, and I'm going to narrate it into the mic. Okay, perfect. And that solves everything. Perfect. So when we're talking about mic, it's not that mic, it's this. Understood. You got it? Okay. Yes. Right. And then how do I hold okay. this to talk into you just, have to wear it's, it? No, it's this part. You have to hold that's the little mic part. Oh, that would have got clipped on. Do you want me to clip it onto your... Yeah, please. Okay, I'll do that right now, Jerry. And then I can clip this to my belt or something. Yeah, okay, I'm just going to put this on here. And let me just see if it's turning you on. Yeah, before you do that. Or you can just hold this, whatever you want it to. And no, I think I'd rather right. clip it. Okay, so right now it is turned off. And then, uh, 
on the very top, right on the very top, there's a little button that is um, uh, no further to you to me. No, 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 to your bell Absolutely, button. I'm happy to be here. Where's the bell there, button? There. Okay. Nope, nope. Oh. Right, right over here. I'm going to move your finger. Right there is a button. Oh, there's more than one? Yeah. I think so. It's not moving towards Okay, here, let, let me try this. With the light comes on. Here, it's on now. It's off now. Yeah, so, it was, so it's off, and then if you push it, um, nope, you're on it. Now push it the other way. Yeah, now it's on. Oh, so I'm away from my mom to put it on. Oh, I can't hear myself. Okay, now. Uh, so it's off right now, so when you want to introduce them, you just push it back away from your bubble. Okay, okay now. Uh, I'm going to leave my cane over there, so when it's time for me to, can you just walk me over like this when you sure. take your so, elbow? So and then well, put me here. Second, you're taking my elbow or I'm taking your elbow? I'm taking your elbow. Okay, perfect. You're so do you want to stay down here, Leslie, because I'll be down here. Oh, okay. So Jerry's doing that. Did you, did you want to add Jerry or do you want me to? I, I could, just, just so that, because you're going to so, will you be then taking this from Jerry yep, after, so for the question? After, okay. the, after the introduction. Okay. So, I just want to do to sort of review a couple of things. One, you got my emails from yesterday. Good. Okay. Yeah, he's so, already been told about them, right? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, he said he doesn't want the bottle of water, so we don't worry about that. Okay. But what I want to do is give you the thank you card okay. so that you'll have that in your hand to provide to him again. So really what it comes down to is we keep an eye, the room right now is pretty full, but I think the easiest for you if we seat you at the table near the podium, so I will help you get there. Well, the only thing is, Joanna, I'd like, uh, Do you want to sit I got a sandwich in my bag, so I, I think I'd kind of like to sit in the front row, so I'm not... I'm hoping you can stop. Fair enough. Then what I'll do... Yeah, he, he asked me how was the sound. I was able to help you to get there. I think I have some slides where you can list that. So just double check that I'm, I'm going to be on that topic here. Because at the end, I do talk about some of that stuff. I've got sufficient content for a couple just walk over to this time. So I have two, I have a false ending right here actually. That's going to be my way. And I'll do my intro, whatever it is. Okay. And while I'm talking, you can just continue behind me to the side. Okay. So we have, or Leslie can do it. Leslie. Like Leslie on so that yesterday was the thing that people see. My name looks like a man and a lot of schools for my students. I've got the clock and everything. So that you said, but it's just easier. I will be here because I'll be here for the next one. Okay. And you know, where I can do it, you want to be kind of small problems of schools. So I don't think we're going to have any problems today. Okay. So whatever you want. If it's well, easier for you, Leslie, then I would like you to you, uh, work with Jerry. Okay, so here's the deal. I'll sit by the table. And when it's time for me to introduce you, I'll, I'll, I'll just take this in my chair. Okay. Let me take it off the chair. Right up to about this position. Sure. And then you can move on to this. Yeah. And then uh, I'll do the little introduction. Now, should we, when we're ready to do it? Yeah, maybe I should thank you at that point. Yeah, I don't know if you've been here the other days. I was just mentioning to Ross that I wasn't sure what you might want to do, but that we found that people leave quite a little bit of time. So we've done a thank you and then do a question. Okay, I think that's what we should do. Because you come and get me here. 
in that part. And we'll just tell Ross here that I'm going to come up at the time he's ready to take questions. Okay, yeah, he's right there, so he's not excited. Oh, okay. I agree. I agree. Don't nod your head, Ross. You'll be nodding all day long. <laughs> I was translating that nod for you. Perfect. I thought you were supposed to have like super hearing so that you could hear me nodding. No, no, no. My wife will, she can confirm that that's a fallacy if you're blind because of Have you learned how to use sonar? I can do it a little bit. Uh, there are actually a few blind people in the world that do echolocation and claim they can walk around obstacles, they can identify things on tables. It's pretty weird, but I, I would be afraid of be tracking bats. Yeah, yeah, no, but so there are some very few people that have these extraordinary talents, but I'm not one of them. I see. I'm ready okay. immediately, um, and we've got eight minutes to noon. Okay, so I'm just going to be sitting over there with my wife, and I'll uh, basically, I'm, I'm, while well, you've read what I'm going to say, I'm just going to say that try to do the little joke that I read about you somewhere uh, sure. about the condensed matter physics. Yeah, and I bring that up, so that's a perfect joke to okay. lead in. And then I'll say that uh, you know, your special interest is that you're as closely involved with the space industry as possible, um, working as a professional, but also treating yourself to hopefully qualify to travel one day in space. Perfect. And, and to that end, one of your very special training uh, activities was to be involved with NASA funded uh, space, uh, Mars habitat, and Hawaii habitat. Perfect. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can't wait to understand what it might be like to live on Mars. So, real life fake Mars, please welcome Dr. Ross Luck. Perfect. And then I'll, and then Leslie will just walk me back to my little seat. And then when you're ready to do the questions, maybe 10 to 1 or whatever that works out to me. Um, just say we're going to do questions, and then she'll come and bring me up here so I can give you your your thank you card. And then we want to just say to people, be quiet when you're leaving the room if possible so we can hear the questions. And we need you to repeat the question always because the people in the other room won't, hear, won't, won't pick up their question from you because it has to be spoken into that mic. Understood. Okay, good. Perfect.
My name is Ross Lockwood. I have a PhD in condensed matter physics, but like you, I used to be young. <laughs> and uh, at four years old, I already knew that I had a passion for space. I asked my mom to make this beautiful uh, sweater for me with a rocket ship with my name on it, flying past the moon, all right? And I grew up in Winfield, BC, uh, where I started off my career as an apple picker, all right? Now that led through a variety of paths to my undergraduate degree in honors physics and then to my PhD in condensed matter physics. Now this talk is actually a broad audience talk. So for the kids in the audience, I usually say that my favorite color is blue and that yes indeed, I hope that my career in the future is an astronaut. So how did this come about? Well. I did a bunch of education, and that seems to be one of the critical factors in becoming an astronaut. So we're not gonna go into detail here, but I do wanna point out that it was during my PhD in 2014 that I left in order to do the high seas experience. So for four months, I had to put my PhD on hold. I had to go through all the rigmarole of getting it actually set in place, and then I had to come back and actually finish my thesis. But the steps that I took to get there were not outside of the bounds of an ordinary student. So when I was a graduate student, I volunteered and worked for the University of Alberta Observatory, where I was probably most famous, many of you may have been there, but I was probably most famous for dressing up the domes as pumpkins for Halloween. <laughs> All right. Um, my extracurriculars included things like scuba diving, which you'd obviously associate with space travel since a lot of the work is done in neutral buoyancy tanks before they go to space. Uh, but I focused on underwater photography so that I could capture great images like this little spotted eel hiding inside of a conch shell at the bottom of the ocean. Now, it's probably going to be the most complicated slide because it involves my PhD. This is what I studied. So the title of my thesis is Photoluminescence of Freestanding Silicon Quantum Dots. So you can think of this like little fat particles in condensed milk. Instead of fat, we made silicon particles. And when you shoot a laser or a blue light at these, they'll take that blue light and convert it down into a different color, so yellow, orange, and red, as you can see on the slide right there. And we use these for some very important things. We developed a method of detecting explosives with these quantum dots because they change color when they're in the presence of an explosive, all right? That's not what we're here to talk about today. Instead, the question that should be driving you right now is, will humans explore Mars? And I just want to remind everybody right now that there are no human explorers on Mars. Despite this movie, it was not filmed on scene, okay? This was filmed in, I think it was filmed in a, the desert in Nevada or somewhere else. I'm gonna have to look that one up. And in the same sense, I have not gone to Mars. Instead, I participated in high seas and that stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog simulation. At this point in the talk, I would usually ask my younger audiences, what do you think an analog in simulation is, right? And they'll come up with a variety of answers. But the way that I like to describe it to them is that we are pretending to be astronauts on Mars. And our job is to do everything that an astronaut on Mars would do. Change our behaviors to experiment in the conditions on Mars. So just like the crew of the Martian, six of us were chosen to depart from a, a ranch in Hawaii okay, and drive up this mountain and live in the dome. So here's the crew, and from left to right, we have Annie Caraccio, who is a NASA chemical engineer working on waste management right now at uh, Kennedy Space Center. We've got Tiffany Swarmer, who is an independent contractor for NASA working on spacesuits at the Johnson Space Center. We've got Lucy Poulet, who is a PhD student now with a project on plant growth in Mars-like conditions. Kim Binstead, the one without the red shirt, she's the director of the mission. She's from Campbell River, BC, and now lives in Hawaii. Casey Stedman, the tall guy in the center, that is our commander, and he's a background as a navigator in the United States Air Force. And there's this next guy that uh, looks a lot like me, and he supposedly is getting a PhD in physics, but at this point, he doesn't have one, remember, okay? 
He's standing next to Hank Rogers, and I know every single one of you has played the video game Tetris. And that's Hank Rogers' baby. He brought that out behind the Iron Curtain in, uh, at the end of the Cold War and licensed it to Nintendo. So he didn't invent it, but he did make a lot of money selling it. And finally, on the right-hand side, we had the oldest member of our crew, Ron Williams, who was 60 years old at the date this photo was taken. And I'll have a fun story about Ron a little later on. So let's skip the Tetris slide. I did a good job explaining that. And we'll start in Hawaii. Now, I want you guys to have a childlike sense of humor. So the next thing that I say, I expect you to laugh. This is called a pu'u. All right? This is called pu'u a wa'a wa'a. And the picture is of the Pu'u Awa'awa'a Ranch, where we started our training, okay? A Pu'u is that feature in the distance there. It's a little mountain, right? This is a late stage volcanic feature. So Hawaii was chosen for some very specific reasons, not just for the high seas study, but if you go back in history to the 1960s and early 1970s, the Apollo astronauts used Volcanoes National Park and the areas around Mauna Loa in Hawaii in order to train for their surface missions on the moon. All right. And similarly, we will expect that astronauts destined to Mars will do that training as well. And that's why we're out there right now starting to figure these things out. So here's a picture of Hawaii, the big island from space. Probably a lot of you people have been here and you'll recognize that there are two major mountains, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. And Mauna Kea is is famous because that's where some of the United States' most powerful astrophysical telescopes are. Not just the United States, but um, consortiums from around the world, including the Hawaii, Canada, France telescope and more. But this was chosen not just because it looks like the moon or it looks like Mars, but because it's geologically similar to a region on Mars known as the Tharsis region. So the same chain of islands that formed Hawaii is thought to have produced these three volcanoes, Ascreus Mons, Pavonis Mons, and Arcea Mons. So the idea is that by doing this study here, we also are giving astronauts an opportunity to learn about the geology that they'll be studying when they get to Mars. And there are going to be lots of problems to get people there. We know that we've got lots of problems here on Earth, and we know that one of those problems is deciding how much money to spend on this. But there's an even bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that astronauts have not spent enough time in space to know what will happen to them if they're there for three years or four years or if they're on a colony mission that doesn't have an end date. So NASA wrote this document in 2009. It's called the Human Health and Performance Risks of Space Exploration Missions, basically stating their case for here are the things we don't know about the psychology and health of astronauts that we need to figure out before we send them away. And chapter two in particular was the study of the high seas mission. So I'll read this out. The title here is risk of performance errors due to poor team cohesion and performance, inadequate selection and team composition, inadequate training and poor psychosocial adaptation. That's why they chose us. All right. We did not get to see who our team members would be until about two months before this mission. We were not trained for team composition or for any of the missions we had. We basically were the control group designed to see how bad things could get. All right. So they didn't just throw us in there. We spent a week traveling around Hawaii looking at some of these features. So in Volcanoes National Park, you'll find the active volcano um, Kilauea, but you also find lots of structures like the Devil's Throat Pit Crater. And this is a structure that was formed when a lava tube deep underground collapsed. It's a hole about 50 meters deep, and uh, this is an important structure. And it's actually um, somewhat related to the actual caldera at Kilauea. So here's just a nighttime photo showing you the red glow of the active lava inside of the Kilauea caldera. It's not erupting right now, but I'll be on the the, the next plane if it does start. Now the reason why this is important is because these structures also exist on other planets and our moon. So we've got Mercury, we've got Mars, uh, we've got the moon, and then we've got this longer chain-like structure of craters on Mars that looks very much like the region selected for the high seas mission. So this is a little video 
uh, flyover that we did after the mission that shows the general vicinity. And the important things to see here are just how isolated this is. There are no other buildings in sight. Um, there is a single dirt road that leads up here. And if you've never walked on lava rock before, or for those of you that have walked on lava rock, you know there's no way someone's hiking up that. It's like walking on shards of glass. Um, as an example, the boots that I wore while I was in the spacesuits, I probably got about 40 hours on them. So not even two days worth of use, and the soles were torn to shreds. So it really is quite isolated out there, very, very rugged. Um, not what we expect from Mars, because Mars has experienced a lot of uh, geological, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Russ, help me out. Erosion in its history. Mars isn't geologically active, so those sharp rocks probably don't exist on Mars. But the overview here is pretty clear. They built the habitat right next to the structure, and it was previously uh, a quarry for building the road up to the Monolo Observatory, so just an earthquake observatory, um, and we're living in the quarry used to build the road. So I'll re-emphasize here that we're very isolated. If you've been to the Big Island, you may have driven up Mauna Kea to see the telescopes, experienced lightheadedness from being at 14,000 feet above sea level and whatnot. Um, but this is a picture from Mauna Kea looking now back towards Mauna Loa. And in this picture, the road is the only man-made structure other than the high seas habitat. So I'll point that out with an arrow. Oop, there you see it. Really far away because the key to this experiment was isolation. And uh, in this final zoom, you can see it's uh, maybe a collection of about 10 pixels there. So you can actually see the habitat from the valley between these two mountains. And if you're really watching carefully in some of the videos, you'll notice that the habitat actually gets a camouflage cover during the mission so that that white dot is not visible to the public. That's just another important part of maintaining isolation in that. Um, in that space. I was actually in a, a bit of a Wikipedia battle this week because Wikipedia, or at least one of the editors contributing to the High Seas article, keeps posting the coordinates to this location. And I keep saying, this is an isolation study. By posting the coordinates, you're compromising that. So keep in mind, just I will emphasize that over and over. Now, here's a bit of a closer view, and you can see that there's solar panels and there's the dome, and we'll go into detail on those. But here we are, a crew of six. We've got two peeking out the window in the dome, and then the other two outside. Now we have these two awesome spacesuits, the white ones that you see that look like real spacesuits. These are Mars analog spacesuits designed to feel like a spacesuit would feel on Mars, including how much it weighs and how much restriction to movement it gives you. Inside of the white suits is also a liquid cooling system. So these tend to overheat the participants and we wear a cooling garment that circulates ice water to keep us nice and cold. But that window is the only window that we could see out of, unless we were in a spacesuit, while we were there. They had a nice view of Mauna Kea. So here we are, the crew of the six of us, starting our Mars mission. And this next video, I'm gonna have to mute it because I'm gonna have to re-narrate it for our audience in the other room. But, let's just make sure we're muted here. I'm gonna take you on a little tour of the dome. So we start out in the video here in the main area, and I'm explaining that the rest of the crew is preparing for an extravehicular activity. They're gonna go outside. And the mission they've been asked to do is to take some of the food and water that we had stored inside the habitat and stash it in one of those cave structures that I mentioned earlier. The reason being is that on Mars, there is no magnetic field to protect the surface of the planet from the sun solar wind, okay? So, when we get to Mars, we're going to have to be dealing with higher levels of background radiation. And one way to deal with that is to build our constructions underground, or at least store our food and water underground, where it's protected from that radiation. So the crew is in the airlock, um, and it's a very high-tech airlock. It has a, uh, hold on here, just one second. It has a zipper, okay? <laughs> Make sure that no air can get in or out, right? And the crew is now doing a five-minute decompression while they wait to go outside, just like a Mars crew would as well. Because the atmosphere outside of the habitat, if it were really on Mars, would be about 1% of the atmosphere that is inside the habitat. Although they are playing with those numbers because, as it turns out, you don't need to be breathing one atmosphere of pressure. So I'm giving a brief little tour of my room, and the bed that's inside of that compartment uh, was about 
the same height as me, so my feet touched the wall while my head touched the opposite wall. It's like a little sardine can for each of the crew members. And we were wedged in the upstairs like oranges in an orange, or, or orange wedges in an orange. And the habitat had two bathrooms, and this is an example of one of them. This one does not have a shower, but it does have a composting toilet. And so if you have a cabin or if it's similar to an outhouse, the idea being that this is a self-contained composting toilet that has a drum, you deposit your waste, you throw in some sawdust, you give it a spin, and six weeks later there's soil that you can plant your tomatoes in, right? Nice and fertilized. Now we didn't do that, thankfully, but we did experiment with growing plants. So this is still upstairs in the dome and looking down you can see kind of our multi-purpose area. We've got some workstations where my 3D printer is running, other experiments are going on, and uh, we have storage for things like the spacesuits. And that red glow that you see as I descend the stairs carefully, of course, is one of our plant growth experiments. And I say that I descend the stairs carefully because if you're on Mars and you fall down the stairs, well, obviously the gravity is a little bit less, so you don't hurt yourself. But we're not on Mars, we're on Earth. And if I fell down the stairs here and hurt myself, the closest doctor is a two hour drive away, okay? So grievous injuries in this part of Hawaii are extremely grievous. And we're just being careful about that kind of thing. Um, so here in the science lab, Lucy has uh, plant growth experiments and we'll get into that in, a, in some more delicious details a little later on. But there's the second bathroom where the shower was situated. Uh, we were allocated one minute of shower time per day. So I banked a day and then the next day I had a two minute shower. So every second day I showered for two minutes. And uh, we're walking through the, um, the living area now to the kitchen area. You can see now what it looks like when we poke our head out this window, or rather not poke our head out because that would be, that would be an accident that would lead to the death of the entire crew on Mars. And uh, it really did look like the surface of Mars, right? This never got old. When I went to bed at night and closed my eyes and heard the, the whistling of the wind against the habitat, I could, I could honestly say to myself, this is the closest experience that you can get on Earth to feel like you're living on Mars. And that included things like food and our power generation system. So we had dehydrated food that we would rehydrate it. And luckily it didn't come in the pouches that you often see NASA producing for their astronauts. We didn't have pre-prepared meals. We had the raw ingredients to create whatever we wanted. And that was a real bonus because we didn't have a regimen. We could do some interesting things. And we will talk about food a lot later because I know there's members of the audience that love hearing about food. So yada, 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 talking about the dishes. We had a laundry facility. We had a power generation system consisting of solar panels, consisting of a battery bank to store the energy, a fuel cell backup, and a gasoline generator backup, backup, which would not be able to run on Mars, but the fuel cell would. So here's a nice picture of uh, my three crew members. They're sitting in their sardine cans, all working and sending emails back home and answering questions to kids at schools. And we basically became the embodiment of our good old friend, uh, what was his name? The Martian, anyway. Um, we didn't grow potatoes, but we did have an assortment of food, and, and let's talk about that. So as far as dehydrated food goes, we considered anything shelf stable for more than four months to be the kind of thing that we would bring with us. So we went to Walmart in the States, we went grocery shopping, and we picked up things like rice and Nutella and pancake batter and dehydrated meats and all that stuff. And it was actually probably the best cooking I've ever done in my life because as far as I'm concerned, I always wanted a stew. And as far as the stew is concerned, all it needs is for you to throw a bunch of stuff in a pot and heat it up. And everything was pre-chopped and, and pre-cooked that all it needed was warm water and it would be ready to eat. So I was a, a chef in this uh, habitat. But that meant that there was no fresh fruit food except for the experiment that Lucy was working on. So of course we couldn't interrupt her experiment. We had to very carefully water these plants on a schedule. But once a month, after she'd taken her measurements, we ate these beautiful salads, right? Not a single other vegetable in there. Once a month, fresh vegetables. That's right. Now, 
I was able to make my favorite recipe, mulligatawny soup. So a curry soup with rice, apples, and chicken. No problem. Tasted better than I make on my own back home. I'm actually I, considering right now making a library of dehydrated vegetables because I want to get back to that level of my, my skills. Now, it's not just about food, obviously. It's also about the activities that astronauts would have done on the high seas mission. So here I have a sequence of images of me getting ready to go outside. Uh, Tiffany here, our space, space suit specialist, was doing a study on stress levels for extravehicular activity. So every time we went outside, Lucy would ask us very nicely if we could spit into a vial for her. Um, she would dutifully take our, our pulse, measure how much oxygen was in our blood, uh, measure our blood pressure, and help us get suited up. So I'm wearing a blue garment that has tubes across the chest. That's my liquid cooling gar garment that's going to keep me nice and cold. And in order to get into our nice white MXC suits, we had to crawl in through the rear end. So there you go, stepping into the legs, crawling up through the backside, and never build a spacesuit like this, okay? Just don't, because the zippers went from the back, where my buttocks is, up to the front, where my chest is. And if I bent over, it would put pressure on the zippers at the back, and the spacesuit would explode open. <laughs> right? And if the pressure outside the suit is lower than the pressure inside the suit, and I was really on Mars, that means that I would die by being sucked out the butt of my spacesuit. <laughs> Now I'll do my best here to narrate the next bit because I'm going to take you outside in a video and again for our audience elsewhere I want, uh, I want them to be able to hear this so there is going to be some subtitles on screen but I'm going to do my best to supplement that with some more information. Um, so now I'm in the airlock, we're separated by a zipper with the rest of the habitat and of course we're waiting five minutes for our simulated air pressure to drop to the level of the Martian atmosphere. Okay. Um, as soon as that's done we can open our nice uh, well, wooden door in this case. Most technology that we used in the high seas habitat was off the shelf components. And this is you know, part of the reason why it's NASA funded um, and part of the reason why we had Hank Rogers backing us. So Hank Rogers actually built this habitat and NASA is leasing it from, from them. So we're gonna step outside. We're gonna have a view from the outside. You notice that we have the camouflage tent up so that uh, people aren't driving up the mountain to say hello to us. And there's this great concept in the Hawaiian language called kokua, which is a kind of a respect. So we also, down the road, had a sign that said, please, kokua, this is an isolation experiment. And by crossing this boundary, you may be interfering with important studies. So we would hike around on these structures. We'd collect samples of rock. We'd take GPS tracks and make measurements. Um, we did quite a bit of exploring, which we'll talk about a little later on. But the purpose of this video is really to show you what the environment around the high seas habitat look like. So in particular, when we're facing this direction, you can see the dome, you can see where we are out on the landscape, and you can see some of the power systems that actually um, we used on a day-to-day -day basis. Power management ended, ended up being one of the most important factors for this mission because there were days where on Earth it's cloudy enough to reduce our total power output by half or, or more and we'd have to unplug certain systems. Um, some of those systems, like the freezer that contained our spit samples, could not be unplugged. So if we had a power shortage, we had to make sure that the most important scientific studies were being preserved. There's a 3D print for you, sir. Uh, so there's our 36 uh, panel solar array. That is a gigantic array. 36 solar panels times about 800 watts. Each is just about 30, kilowatt, uh, 30 kilowatts. So storing those in the battery, that proves some efficiency problems. But that being said, the battery bank that we had inside was plenty for us to get through an entire night running things like fridges and freezers and all of the air systems. And just like in The Martian, we had our set of challenges. So there's a, a scene in the movie and also uh, described very well in the book where he has to repurpose a satellite for communications. And uh, while we had some communications issues that required solutions like this, one of the major challenges that we encountered was a water issue where the calibration of our sensor indicated we had more water than we did, leading us to lose water completely, all right? And uh, this is a great example that I use quite often in high schools because you look at a graph like this that shows our water consumption over time and it's descending and you can actually predict then when we would run out of water. So 
Uh, in order to solve this problem, we had to do what uh, our man in the Martian had to do too. He says, have you ever done electronics while wearing a spacesuit? It's a pain in the, excuse my language. Um, and indeed, we had to do just that. So our water system failed, had a sensor failure that was caused by running out of water, uh, repriming the system, and breaking the connection of the sensor when we reprimed the system. So we had to actually attach these things. And there's an added challenge that not only am I wearing gloves that are like spacesuit gloves, so I'm manipulating things like knives and pliers and soldering irons with big, thick gloves on, but where it broke was a join between two different kinds of cable that didn't have their wires labeled. So it was a guessing game to try and get it set up properly. And in the end, we did get it fixed. And today, I can log on to the high seas system and I can see how much water the crew that's there right now is actually using. So we could see if you know one of the crew members was having a shower at the moment, if we, if we really wanted to, okay? Just from data, just from the water data. Right? This is how powerful it is to collect that kind of graph. Um, so that's an example of one of the challenges we had. Some of the more fun missions that we did were the exploration missions. So here about this fantastic photo of uh, Lucy and Annie out on a spacewalk. And if you look very carefully in Annie's hand, the one with the blue suit, she's got what's called the Swampworks Geotool. This is a tool that is similar to the one that the astronauts went to the moon carried. It's a, it's a, a tool used to determine the composition of the soil or the shear forces of the soil. So you can see, is this dusty sand or is it thick mud, for example, right? But we went out on these exploration missions looking for the structures that I alluded to before. So these are smaller versions of Devil's Throat Pit Crater. This is uh, a very small skylight in a very small lava tube. But we were looking for these kind of structures. So I'll describe what a lava tube is. Essentially, when you have flowing lava down a mountain, it's coursing like a river. But imagine a river in sub-zero temperatures where it's cold enough for the surface of the river to freeze. Okay, this is exactly the same as what happens in a lava tube. We've got a river of lava flowing down a mountain, and obviously it's cold enough outside of the lava tube for the top surface to congeal and harden. So when that happens, liquid lava continues to flow through the tube but as soon as the source of lava is gone, the lava tube drains and leaves behind these incredible structures that exist here on Earth that you can go into and sometimes as far as several hundred kilometers explore these things. So the idea being that if you had an inflatable habitat on Mars and you found one of these structures, you could just bring your habitat down into the cave, inflate it in place, and have enough radiation protection to survive for many, many more years, right? Same problem with radiation here on Earth is that it causes cancer. So you want to get away from as much of it as possible. Um, now, the 3D print that's going around, that was one of the things that was part of my study. So inside the high seas habitat, we did have a 3D printer. And if you don't know what a 3D printer is, it's a, essentially a glue gun. Okay, squirting glue out vertically, and then it's it's actually being moved on a robotic carriage. So the glue gun is following a pattern and building up, in this case, uh, an actual model of the high seas habitat. But it's more powerful than just making models and just making toys and just making flexible little squares like that. We were testing 3D printed surgical instruments. So in this picture, Casey Stedman, he's got a tissue pad that he's practicing uh, sutures on, so he's actually tying some uh, stitches, and in his other hand he has a 3D printed pair of tweezers. Okay, The idea being that we were actually comparing a 3D printed surgical tool to a stainless steel tool. We had many tools, this is just one of the examples, but what we found is that in all cases operators of 3D printed tools were as fast as operators of stainless steel tools. Okay. On two of the 160 tests that we did, the 3D printed tools broke. And that's not something that you want to have happen when you're doing surgery. So that is an existing problem that needs to be solved before we print surgical instruments. But why are we printing these instruments at all? Well, stainless steel weighs a lot. Stainless steel is hard to recycle. So if you're going to go to Mars and you have a material that is easily recyclable, you can make these things on demand. And these are made out of ABS, and when they're extruded, they're extruded at about 150 degrees Celsius, so they're naturally sterile right after, right after they come off the print bed. That's why 3D printing is so cool, all right? Um, 
we were also, or rather, you know, how am I going to transition to this? So it wasn't all fun and games, right? There was work involved. But because it's a psychology mission and because the crucial aspects were determining how our psychology was changing, it was crucial to have fun and games. All right, so our neighbors on Mauna Kea, they had some giant lasers that they would fire periodically to measure the disturbances in the atmosphere to calibrate their telescopes. And on occasion, we'd go out and we'd take some astrophotography. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to see on the projector, but coming from the top of the mountain is a faint yellow line that is the Mauna Kea lasers, all right? So we didn't just go out to do that. We did all sorts of things, time lapses, uh, long exposures, spelling Mars. Uh, I was there from the end of March to the beginning of August, so I got to celebrate Canada Day on Hawaii in the United States, pretending to be on Mars. All right? Um, it looks like I skipped some of the food that we made that day, but I do want to share that it's possible to create pancakes uh, and bacon with the ingredients that we had, and strawberries, and maple syrup. Perfect. Uh, the same day for lunch, we created created ah, craft dinner and ham chunks. That's right. For dinner, we had a improvised poutine made from dehydrated hash browns, dehydrated mozzarella cheese, and dehydrated gravy powder. And for dessert, we created Nanaimo bars from our dehydrated nuts and baking materials. So Canada Day was a lot of fun for me. But other occasions where we had some fun were things like May Long Weekend, where we'd normally be going camping with friends back home. So we set up a tent fort in our multi-purpose area. We went on a camping trip, and everybody knows the first rule of space travel is you don't set fires in space. So instead of a campfire, we had a colored orange soap container illuminated by flashlights. Okay. Um, today is May the 11th, so when, when we encountered May the 4th, everybody recognizes that as uh, Star Wars Day. So a little bit of cosplay. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Ron's not in any of these pictures. And he's not taking these pictures because we simulated his death. That's right, we killed Ron on Mars, um, but not in real life. So the reason why that happened, uh, at 60, Ron was obviously um, <laughs> 60, he's, he's 60. Um, and after 24 days, he was su suffering from some severe sleep apnea because of, the <laughs> because of the height that we were at. So one thing that we skipped in the video is that I mentioned that we're at 8,000 feet. So when we're thinking about Hawaii, and where we were, you've got to imagine that that's the altitude of the peak of Whistler in BC. So it was actually, throughout the summer, very cold. And even in March, uh, there was a snowfall at our elevation. So that's just to give you an idea that it wasn't tropical Hawaii and we weren't going surfing on weekends. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but Ron died. And, uh, and so we had a funeral for him in space. And we did discuss things like, how do you deal with a body when you're on Mars, right? So our solution was to throw his body in the airlock, um, pump the pressure down, cool the, the module down, and freeze dry him, and then bundle him up and vacuum pack his whatever is left, and, and save it for later so that, you know, got beef jerky. I mean, this is a problem. Okay, and I didn't mention, I keep forgetting, there's lots of things I'm not mentioning here, but to get to Mars, we're predicting that's going to take a year and a half to get there. We're predicting that it's going to be a minimum of 30 days on the surface and up to three years on the surface and then a minimum of a year and a half to get back. So we're talking at the shortest a three-year, one-month mission at the longest upwards of 10 years, right? So we do not know how six people will fare together for that period of time. And if four months is any indication for me with six people, it's going to be a problem, all right? That being said, we are the control group, so they basically just chucked us in there and said, become friends or not, we don't care. Um, another game we played, uh, you may have seen souvenirs like this at Telus World of Science. This was one that uh, was a common thread throughout that kept us on our toes. This was called the rover game. And I often play this in a classroom as I'm doing it. I didn't bring my rover here today, but if I had, 
it would be somewhere in this room. The one rule is that when you hide the rover, it must be in plain sight. Corner of a roof joist right here, it's in plain sight. And the goal is that every day someone tries and find the rover, they gain the point, and they hide it again for the next day. And at the end of it, you can see who was just the most excited about winning. It was little letter R right there with 36 points. So um, another piece of evidence that I've got great eyesight. Um, now just to draw a conclusion to the similarities to the Martian, you can see that there's this great picture of, of the Martian sitting out on a rock. And uh, two years before the movie came out, here's me. So <clears throat> I just want to tell Hollywood right now that uh, they owe me one. All right. Uh, now, as far as the high seas missions goes, I can talk for hours and hours and hours, and we don't have a lot of time left. So I'm going to go and talk about something that I was not asked to speak about. Um, last year, there was an astronaut recruitment campaign, and I did apply. I had the minimums. I got my PhD after the high seas experience. Uh, I qualified with all the minimum requirements, so I submitted it. It says here, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're writing you to inform you that, okay. So I passed an exam on this one. Now, I got pretty far in the astronaut recruitment campaign. Uh, here it says, the pre-selection board has retained approximately 160 candidates. Although interesting, your candidacy was not retained. So yeah, that's disappointing, but it also tells me I'm 161st in line, right? <laughs> that is not a long lineup if you're at Disneyland. Right? That's not a long lineup if you're waiting to go and see a movie in the theater. So that being said, there are only two new astronauts, and they have not yet been announced for this year, but I will not be one of them, sadly. Um, and normally this is where I'd stop. I'd say, if you have any questions, now would be an inappropriate time. And uh, the first answer is yes, you can lick the inside of a spacesuit, so no problem. <laughs> but let's just briefly go into some of the adventures I've had since, all right? So in the same vein of asking, will humans ever travel to Mars, I have another question that I like to ask. Can anyone, emphasis on anyone, become an astronaut, right? And right now the answer is no. You need to either have a military background, you need to be in your mid-30s or mid-40s, you need to have a single-minded determination on being the most professional person in your area of research and all that stuff. Uh, but we're entering an era which I like to call the new space race, where it's not federal space agencies that are that are um, competing for launch opportunities. And, and we know now that SpaceX is right on the verge of launching one of their first uh, human-operated capsules. They'll be testing that over the next two years and probably launching as early as 2018, as, as, far, as, I can, uh, as far as I know right now. But in the interest of answering this question, I decided to go out and do a bunch of stuff. So let's skip through this as quickly as possible. I participated in Project Possum. I got to wear a commercial spacesuit, right? One that's being designed by a company in um, New York that intends to sell these suits to companies like SpaceX and uh, x Links in order for their astronauts to have suitable protection when they're in low Earth orbit, okay? And part of this Project Possum was flying in aerobatic aircraft. So, not the pilot, okay? Emphasize this, I'm not the pilot. But what we're doing in these aircraft is we're experiencing the G-forces that you'd experience in a rocket launch. So this is going to be a 4GZ loop. And I'm going to experience four times the force of gravity for a fraction of a second here as we go through the peak of the loop. Here we go. Now, this was not, I didn't throw up. <laughs> but I did get nauseated. Um, and uh, luckily, it was right about the turnaround point for our flight. So when I said, you know, I'm starting to feel bad, the pilot was like, no problem, we'll take you home. Um, now, out the last part of this loop here, we're actually going to do a little microgravity parabola. So I've got a blood pressure monitor that we were using for testing. It's just kind of floating in front of my hands and spinning a little bit. Not very good, I have to say. That's pretty bad. So we went up, we went up it. We went up to Ottawa. We got into their Falcon 20 jet that's equipped with, uh, well, a daredevil pilot, I should say. And uh, we're wearing these suits. We've got air cooling and the scuba tanks in the front there. And I think I can go a little bit fast in here, but this is a, a parabolic flight that the microgravity experience lasts for about 20 seconds. So 
Um, in this video, we are going to be doing range of motion tests where we're flailing our arms around and making sure that there's no pinch points in the suit. Um, and I mean, just something to, to point out here is how pale and clammy my face looks. Uh, because after this video, and, and I won't show this to you, I, I do throw up right in front of this camera. <laughs> So, you know, I think that most astronauts are liars because they don't talk about throwing up. Um, and they do appear very sick when they get back to Earth. Um, so we should be pressuring them to talk more about uh, what happens to their bodies when they, when they come down and when they get back. I feel like that's an area that also needs a lot of research because coming back from a six-year mission on Mars and standing in Earth gravity, you're almost guaranteed to have a broken bone. Uh, didn't stop there. Got into one of these uh, dunker tank experiments where they pretend you're in an astronaut, or in our case, we're pretending to be in a spacecraft, landing in the ocean, a sploosh, and having a catastrophic failure and having the craft fill up with water. So we got to practice what military pilots and commercial pilots do when their aircraft hit the ocean, and we got to escape. So on the near side here, you'll see me emerging, a white helmet and an orange suit momentarily. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun too. I like. Uh, I like things that scare other people. It's not very scary to me. And that's, a, that's definitely something that you have to worry about too. If you have an astronaut who's not afraid of anything, that's a problem. So I do have healthy fears, like spiders. Okay, um, so we're not done yet, of course not. Um, I'm just not the kind of guy to stop there. I went to Connecticut and I participated in a University of Texas medical branch study. Ah, and I love it when it's a study because it means I get to do it for free. And I got to ride on the NASTAR centrifuge. Now this, uh, this machine, it says G on demand on the side. And what that means is they can produce G-forces that any military aircraft, any rocket, any um, childhood amusement park ride, anything. They could do it in this machine. And it's essentially a giant mining motor that has a, a big arm on it. And at the end of the arm is a little... Um, capsule that inside has a virtual reality screen that represents the control panel of the spaceship or whatever you want. So when this gets you know, just about here, when we speed up, this is simulating the launch of the X-Core Lynx rocket engine. So I'm sitting in there um, flying around in the X-Core Lynx and then they light the rockets and we feel an acceleration of 4Gs, this time for two minutes instead of about two seconds. Uh, so here's a video of the interior of the capsule, and if you look carefully in that right-hand corner, you can see GZ, GX, and Max GR. The number beside Max GR is what I'm experiencing right now, 4.4 Gs. So take my 160 pounds, multiply it by 4, 400, 200, 600-ish pounds. How does that sound? So that's how, how heavy my body is. But what they don't tell you, or what people often forget, is that the launch is actually one of the most controlled parts of a spacecraft's flight. And it's the re-entry that is the dangerous and the violent experience. So momentarily, we're going to actually be re-entering the atmosphere here and watch that max GR number right now. I know it's stuck at 4.4, but that's going to rise to 6. And when it hits 6, my body weighs 1,000 pounds. Okay? My arms, which I estimate, it's hard to know how heavy your arms are because you're always lifting them, but it's about 15 pounds. So imagine if I'm touching a button on a control panel and reaching out in front of me, it's not 15 pounds. It's about 80 pounds. So it's like I'm holding a 65 pound barbell whenever I have to push a button on my console. All right? um, so this study was really designed to evaluate the health of, of civilians when they go on tourist rides on something like the Expo Lynx or the Good Shepherd, New Shepherd. So um, I could keep going, but I am going to stop here to take some more questions. So here's the real end of the talk. And uh, again, if you do want to follow up with me after the fact, you can reach me online at Spin Crisis, spincrisis.com. My name is Ross Lockwood, so <laughs> rosslockwood.com works. Um, you can find me on Facebook. You can Google me. Don't Google me. No, do Google me. So let's take a few minutes. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We are going to take questions. We, it gets hectic during the question period, so we ask you that you stay quiet as possible if you're leaving, and Ross will take a few questions. We just want to make sure we don't miss the opportunity to thank him. I, I think uh, I did learn a little bit what it might be like to travel in space, and it's certainly, you, 
wonder how the whole concept of space tourism can even exist when you understand what kind of training endeavors he's already encountered. But hey, if you go to Mars, you can keep your craft dinner. There you go. <laughs> Imagine the things that are common between two worlds and craft dinner comes up in the conversation. I can't believe it. So thank you for a presentation that was just out of this world. We have a thank you card from Ella. Thank you very much. And uh, please we'll keep the questions in there. Okay. Thanks once again, Ross. I'm going to do a common trick that I do with uh, my classes here. So if you've got a question, hands up right now, please. You're number one. You're number two. You're number three. You're number four. You're number five. Okay, remember your number. And we'll start with number one. When I'm inside the centrifuge, is it difficult to breathe? And indeed it is because not only is your body experiencing those G-forces, but your chest is. So when we're talking about how much your chest weighs, I mean, I, maybe women will have a better estimation of this, but imagine, you know, sestupling the weight of the flesh on the front of your body and that's crushing down on you. So um, the way that I describe it is like being cuddled by an elephant, right? It wasn't painful. But it wasn't comfortable. I mean, it was, you know, cuddling to an elephant is what I mean, right? So I'm doing a breathing technique called the hook maneuver. And what I'm doing is I'm maintaining a high pressure inside my lungs. And then I'm very quickly breathing out and breathing in, back in. So it gets its name from the sound you make. And so my lungs are mostly filled during that. So that's how that works. And, and obviously that's only when you're experiencing those high accelerations. But another effect that comes from the G-forces is that the blood in your head gets pushed down into your body. So you have a blackout scenario. Or if you're upside down, in the same case, you'd have a redout scenario. So you also need to control your glutes and your buttocks and push the blood that's pooling in your legs back up into your torso. Um, so a really cool effect that I saw at the end of this 6G run was that my vision was narrowing down and that when I squeezed my butt, I could see the actual pattern of the retinas at the back of my eyes filling the blood of my retina again. So my vision was being restored in that branching uh, arterial pattern that you see when you go to the optometrist at the back of your eye. Um, so that was great. All right, question number one. Question number two. Sure, so while we were in high seas, did we have relationship difficulties? Um, and indeed, yes, we did. So some of the management techniques, let's talk about specific problems. Ron ate all of the Nutella. <laughs> so we killed him. <laughs> all right. Now, there are professional disagreements that came up. Uh, and that was mostly related to procedures when we were doing things like geological training. And this is what happens when you throw a chemical engineer from NASA in with a physicist from the University of Alberta is that we're going to have different ideas about how to proceed with a topic that neither of us are experts in. How do you measure the volume of a mountain, right? So Annie's solution was to go out and walk around every little hill and valley and measure how big they are and go and figure this out and take 16 days to do it. And me being the lazy physicist said, I am going to go out once. I'm going to get all the data that I need once and I'm going to come back in and be done with this. And my technique, instead of going and measuring every little thing, is to walk the perimeter of the mountain to get the baseline, and then walk over the mountain to get the profile, and then to do a simple rotation to get a three-dimensional volume. Right? Easy peasy. And I made a bet. I was like, if I'm within 10% of your value, um, you have to listen to me from now on. Or something. Well, as it turns out, uh, no one wanted to do 16 days worth of EVAs, and in the end, they just decided to go with my estimation instead of actually trying to figure it out. So that was the kind of struggle that we faced, um, and that didn't have the kind of psychological solution that you'd expect. So what we did was we made sure that we had a clear divide between work and not work, um, and that was our meal times. So before meal times, like between breakfast and dinner, that is work. As soon as you sit down for dinner, any professional disagreement that you had during the day dissolves and you talk about your friends and your family from home and what your interests are and why you have a particular um, hatred for physics or something like that, right? Um, 
So, you know, that was one of them. But I have to say that the most valuable psychologically healthy activities were the games that we played. Um, and I'll share a dirty anecdote because you guys can handle it. But uh, at one point, I think it was during our camping trip, we played hide and go seek inside the dome. It's 1,600 square feet, so, you know, it's not supposed to be hard. And obviously, we weren't allowed to go outside. But um, the dome actually consisted of two layers. Most of the crew didn't know that you could get in between them. So I went and I hid in between the two layers, um, kind of like a spider, you know, stretched out and really awkward. And um, Lucy was it, and she was looking around, and everyone had been found but me. And so they were kind of scouring it with more and more detail. And Lucy noticed two bumps in the fabric of the dome. <laughs> So I got the biggest spanking of my life <laughs> playing Hide and Go Seek on Mars. All right, who's my number three over here? People. Thank you. Give up on worrying about contamination is one easy answer. Um, so the question is, uh, when we visit other planets, one of the primary goals is not to contaminate those planets. And the reason that we don't want to do that is because we still don't know how, um, let's, for lack of a better term, just call it biological life. So life based on RNA and DNA. Some of the theories on the origin of life include some trips to Mars in the early solar system. So specifically talking about the primordial soup here on Earth, the theory still is that we have an RNA-based organism that started copying itself in the primordial soup. But because there was so much turmoil in the early solar system that collisions happened quite frequently, and that some of those replicators could have traveled and landed on Mars and survived there in the more favorable Mars-like conditions in the early solar system, and then come back on another collision. So if there's evidence for life on Mars, it doesn't just mean that we've discovered aliens. It means that we've discovered more about our own origins. And if we go there and we contaminate it with existing bacteria and we say we can't distinguish between what was on Mars and what we brought to Mars, then we're basically destroying one of the primary reasons to even go. Um, so that's a hard problem to face. And one of the ways that you do it is by never exposing um, the exterior of your spacecraft or your spacesuit to the interior. And that's hard to do, especially in the case of spacesuits. But if you look at how spacesuits are actually being developed for Mars, some of them have a big flange on the back. So that instead of bringing the spacesuit inside, what you do is you back up to your habitat with this big flange on your back, and you basically just dock to the habitat so that the outside of the spacesuit stays out, and then you crawl backwards through the hatch, and then you're inside of your habitat. And then to get back in, you crawl through the flange, now you're in your suit, you undock, and you stay sterile. Now, one of the things about the surface of Mars is that it does not have the magnetic protection from solar wind. So in all likelihood, anything that was deposited on the surface would just get scorched, and that the signs of life we're looking for are further down in the ground. Yeah. Number three. Number four. Number four. Why couldn't we compensate? <laughs> you know, we could. Um, but NASA has a very long history of preserving the human sanctity, in, even in death, right? Um, so for us, it came down to a matter of t tradition, right? So traditionally, you probably wouldn't compost somebody. If it were me, like, yes, you know, I'm going to crush his bones and make more 3D printing material. Uh, right? Uh, because I think that, you know, one of, the, one of the problems, one of the sticking points that we have are traditions that do not permit, you know, that, traditions that seem more important than survival, right? And so, like, you do have to consider what would happen if a, a greenhouse stopped working, or what happened if a crew member did die and food was limited, right? And I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that in the future, someone gets eaten, right? That happens all the time in science fiction. So, you know, that's basically a prediction. 
But we also discussed lots of other ways that we could deal with a body on, on Mars. Um, one of the things was actually to leave it on Mars, right? And you run into all sorts of the same problems with contamination if you do that. And we'll end with number five. Who is my number five? There you go. Somewhat related to the question number two, we talked a little bit about the information system. We ended up talking about what the purpose is of study. This is where this is to try to evaluate your studies in terms of the plan or the plan on the mission's ability. So, is there a part of the program in some analysis? So, looking at what happens while you were there that NASA does. Absolutely, yeah, totally. Um, so, this is not just a, a fun thing to do. NASA is taking this very seriously. Um, I'm just going to pull this up to make a joke. But um, so, the question basically is: Are there results coming out of the high sea study? And the answer now is yes. Um, initially, the first high seas mission was a food study. Our mission was the second one, that's a psychology study, and it was a series of three studies that got progressively longer. So we did four months or 120 days, the next crew did eight months, the next crew did 12 months. And now we're back to a new series of missions that are going to start and stay at the eight month length. So the three missions that extended in length, those were the core of the psychology study, and that ended about a year ago. So now the papers are finally being published and, you know, the little squiggles and data points are, are being put in there. It's anonymized because, you know, we don't want them pointing fingers at me saying, why did you eat Nutella after Ron died? Um, but if you see a graph that has 18, 17, 13, 23, and 36 somewhere on it, uh, that will be, you can, you can point at the 36 and say that was me. Um, so it's starting to come out. And as the lab rat, I'm not, they don't tell me very much. All right, so we're 24 seconds from our deadline. Thank you very much.